on this episode of Weather Watch. We go behind the scenes of local news giant WGAL to experience a day in the life of a broadcast meteorologist. Then we'll begin our countdown to the number one northeast snowstorm in the very first installment of the Weather Watch Top 5. Finally, we'll check in with our very own team of Mythbreakers as they tackle yet another slate of common weather myths. All this and more coming up on Weather Watch. Hello and welcome to the season premiere of Weather Watch, Millersville University's exclusive weather news program. I'm your host, Shane Brown. This season, we plan to bring you more of the great weather news and entertainment that you've come to expect from us here at Weather Watch. But first, on behalf of the entire cast and crew, we want to thank you, the viewer, for making our first season such a huge success. Now, as you may know, we have been off the air for the summer season, so we need to take this time to get you caught up on the weather news and headlines from around the globe. Here is the special summer edition of Your World's Weather in 60 Seconds. Landslides in Bangladesh, a parade of typhoons in Southeast Asia, and our own tropical trouble in the Gulf highlight this edition of Weather in 60 Seconds. But for this special edition, we're going to throw two minutes on the clock to get you caught up on the world's weather events from this past summer. So let's get started with the summer edition of Weather in 60 Seconds. Starting off in Bangladesh, where torrential rainfall caused historic flooding and landslides that have claimed the lives of over 100 people. The heavy rains, associated with the region's seasonal monsoon, forced thousands from their homes as floodwaters swept through over 2,000 villages. Similar conditions would later affect neighboring India where nearly a million people were displaced from their homes after 20 inches of rain fell in just one day. Moving now to Southeast Asia, where a parade of typhoons would strike the continent in quick succession. Three typhoons would impact the region in only a span of two weeks. The first, Typhoon Seola, would bring nearly 70 inches of rain to parts of Taiwan, as well as extreme flooding in mainland China. Just one day later, Typhoon Damre would make landfall just a few hundred miles north of Seola. Damre would bring even more torrential rainfall, as well as extensive wind damage. Just one week later, a third typhoon, Haikwei, would make landfall over the same region as Seola and Damre. In total, the three storms would cause nearly $3 billion in damage, displace millions from their homes, and claim the lives of nearly 100 people. And finally, to the United States, where our own tropical trouble would find its way into the Gulf of Mexico. Hurricane Isaac would make landfall just to the south of the mouth of the Mississippi River in Louisiana. Isaac, which was nearly 400 miles in diameter at its largest, brought widespread flooding to parts of the Gulf Coast. This would prove to be the first real test of new drainage and levee systems which were implemented following Katrina in 2005. Isaac would cause more than $2 billion in damage spreading from the Gulf Coast to the Northeast. Widespread reports of over a foot of rain would come out of areas in Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, and Florida. At least nine fatalities were caused as a direct result of the storm. And that will do it for this special summer edition of Weather in 60 Seconds. As weather people, we always get asked, what's the greatest storm of all time? Well, here at Weather Watch, we decided to turn this question into a bit of a novel concept. We've assembled five of the most potent storms in a given category, and on each episode, we'll count them down for you until we reach the number one storm on our list. So which category will we look at this season, and which storms made our list? Peter Molinax has all of the details in the first installment of the Weather Watch Top 5. <laughs> On this season of Weather Watch, we'll be starting a new segment. Each season, we will take five memorable storms, rank them, and count them down for you in each episode. This season, we are starting with our very first top five, Northeast Snowstorms. 
You don't have to go back too far to remember our number five storm, or should I say storms. The back-to-back -back blizzards of February 2010 dropped over 20 inches of snow across our region, including 43 inches of snow in a five-day span here at Millersville. This historic period of snowfall was affectionately named Snowmageddon. Here's a look back at our number five northeast snowstorm. The back-to-back -back snowstorms of 2010 produced record-setting snowfall across much of the mid-Atlantic. The first of the two snowstorms swept through on the evening of February 5th. The snow totals were astonishing. Dulles International Airport reported 32.4 inches, making it the single largest snowfall ever recorded. Other snow totals include 28.6 inches at Philadelphia International, 25 at Baltimore Washington International, and 17.8 at Reagan National Airport in Washington, D.C. This snowstorm left the major metropolis of D.C., Baltimore, and Philadelphia paralyzed from the significant snowfall. But just four days later, another nor'easter was on the prowl, providing another 10 to 20 inches between D.C. and New York City during February 9th through the 10th. As a weather historian and native of Lancaster County, what really stands out about those uh, twin storms of February 2010 is uh, the magnitude of the events and how close together they came. Uh, historically, storms of 18 inches or more occur here only three or four times a decade. And of course, in this instance, we had two of those storms in a four or five day period. Both snowstorms helped contribute to the snowiest February in recorded history for Dulles, Baltimore, Washington, and Philadelphia, with 46.1 inches falling at Dulles, 50.9 inches at BWI, and a stunning 51.5 in Philadelphia. Snowmageddon will go down as one of the main reasons for record-breaking seasonal snowfall in much of the mid-Atlantic. Here at the Millersville Weather Center, we have a wintertime forecasting contract with PennDOT. We provide them with very detailed forecasts of upcoming storms. And I remember uh, heading into the first big storm uh, of the pair, uh, you know, being up pretty much for 48 hours straight, uh, helping give them guidance on that upcoming storm and thinking, I'm going to get a break after it was over. Well, what I didn't know is there was a second storm on the way. So it ended up being about a five-day stretch where uh, I was pretty sleep deprived. Reporting for Weather Watch, I'm student meteorologist Pete Mullinax. Thanks, Pete. Well, we're going to take a quick commercial break, but first, let's see how you do with this episode's weather trivia. Welcome back. It's a tough enough job trying to predict something as complicated as the weather, but to do it in front of a camera for millions of people takes a special effort. WeatherWatch was granted exclusive access behind the scenes at local news giant WJL to meet the team behind your daily weather forecast. WeatherWatch's own Matthew Moore gives us a glimpse of a day in the life of a broadcast meteorologist. The world around us moves at an alarming rate. In this fast-paced world, people demand simplicity, accuracy, and entertainment, and want it available at the exact moment they choose. In the world of meteorology, there is one group in particular dedicated to fulfilling the needs of a fast-paced society. The people responsible for directly connecting meteorology with the general public are called broadcast meteorologists. These individuals work day in and day out to take a complicated science and simplify it into an understandable and entertaining forecast that viewers can depend on. WeatherWatch was able to go behind the scenes at WGAL-TV to speak with some of the News 8 storm team. WGAL is located in southeastern Pennsylvania and is broadcasted to over 700,000 homes across the lower Susquehanna Valley. We spoke with Chief Meteorologist Joe Calhoun and veteran evening weathercaster Doug Allen to discuss the primary responsibilities of a broadcast meteorologist and some of their favorite parts of the job. As the Chief Meteorologist, um, I guess the overall product is, uh, our weather product here at WGAL is my uh, essential responsibility and I kind of oversee that. Um, and I think as a team effort, it, it, you get a better product, you get a better forecast, you get a better story, 
uh, you, get, you, you know, one person may have one idea, another person may have another idea. It's my job to, to try to oversee that and to manage that. Favorite part of the job is when you come in and you can look at one of your colleagues and say, I love when the forecast pans out. When you've had a tough forecast, be it stormy or whatever, and you can come in the next day after the fact and say, man, that was on the money, then that's, that's satisfaction right there. I think the competition. Um, what I mean by that is I, I, I hate being wrong, and I love to be right, and I love to get a forecast right. I hate to bust on a forecast. So, I mean, I, I, I think I work pretty hard at that. On most days, many people tune into the local news just to get their local weather report. But on some days, Mother Nature can throw a curveball and create severe weather that can put lives in danger and create damage to property. It is the primary responsibility of a television meteorologist to keep the viewing area up to date and to keep you out of harm's way. Staying on top of the storm and getting the word out to the public. Uh, those are the key things right there, I, I believe. Uh, you know, when you get into a severe weather situation, you're oftentimes into a very short fused forecast situation. The storm is here, in 30 minutes it will be here. And oftentimes you're in a now casting situation, which means reading, interpreting the radar, and immediately imparting that information to the public so that they can, if they're in the path of this thing, take action. In an emergency situation, you, you can't have confusion about the message. It has to be, you know, severe thunderstorm warning, where, when, and, and what it means. It can't be, you know, uh, you know wishy-washy. It can't be uh, complicated. It has to be clear, concise, and timely. Being in the public spotlight certainly does have its advantages, but it also means you have to have a thick skin. Delivering a forecast that people plan their day around means that you have to be accurate and concise while also accepting responsibility for when Mother Nature has a change in plans. Joe and Doug share some insight on what it's like to be in the public spotlight. You have to have a thick skin. You do. You have to be uh, on your guard. You have to be polite and congenial and uh, you have to be prepared to take insult and manage injury. Most people are very nice. Occasionally you get people to complain. You know, they let you know your product was bad, your, your forecast was bad, or you know, they didn't like the, what, what, you know, something you said on the air. Or, you know, um, and there are customers. So, you know, I have to be um, cognizant of that and, and treat them that way. It's kind of a, a pervasive thing. You walk through the mall you, and, and, and they, the people sometimes will literally push the family out of the way so they can come up and say hi. And oftentimes it's unintentional. They don't realize they're doing it, but it can be a challenge sometimes. The life of a television meteorologist is certainly not an easy one. Being the face behind many forecasts can lead to blaming and finger pointing from the general public. It can also be a very rewarding experience. From your local severe weather coverage to your forecast, your local television meteorologist is there for you. Reporting for Weather Watch, I'm Matthew Moore. Great stuff, Matt. Thanks a lot. Last season, we debuted the Mythbreakers, our very own team of weather specialists bent on turning bad weather myth into weather fact. Well, this season, they're back and at it again with a whole new slew of weather myths to break. Let's take a look at what our Mythbreakers are up to now. When the lines between weather fact and fiction are blurred, we call in the experts, the Myth Breakers. It's a scorcher out there with afternoon highs expected to reach the upper 90s. Make sure to stay cool. Speaking of cool, let's get back to some cool jazz. Now, Mommy will only be a few minutes. You guys hang tight. Okay, Mommy. <gasps> Forget something? Uh, what? Thought it was a good idea to leave these two in here? Well, I mean, it was only a little while. I figured they would be okay. 
On days like this, temperatures in your car can quickly exceed dangerous levels. In fact, in just one hour, the temperature in your car can easily exceed 140 degrees. That's good enough to put Fido and your kid here in serious trouble. Even with an outside temperature in the 80s, the temperature inside your car can reach triple digits in just a matter of minutes. Oh, well, thank you. You kept my baby safe. That we did. W wait, who are you guys? When people make bad decisions involving the weather, we show up. We're the Myth Breakers. There's a storm coming. I think you should get out of the shower. But I have a hot day tonight. I'll be fine. <gasps> Maybe you should step out of the shower. What the? How do you get in here? Don't worry about that. We're just here to make sure you don't make a decision you'll regret. What do you mean? My date's gonna be a bust? Unless if you think a hospital is romantic. Didn't you hear the thunder outside? He's right. It only takes one lightning strike in the vicinity to send a dangerous current through your plumbing and wiring. I find that very unlikely. Unlikely, huh? 20 people annually get electrocuted by lightning in their own homes. So most of it's right here in their own bathroom. In 2011, a Swedish teenager was taking a shower at her parents' house and she got struck by lightning twice. She was severely burned. She was lucky. On average, eight people die a year due to lightning strikes. Oh wow, this shower can wait. I guess I'll call my date and say I'm running a little behind. I'd make that call from your cell phone if I were you. It wouldn't hurt to unplug all of your electronics either. Oh, and I would stay away from the windows, at least until the storm has passed. You betcha, thanks for the heads up. Anytime. Looks like that's another myth broken. Well, that's going to do it for this season debut episode of Weather Watch. Make sure to like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at the addresses shown below. Be sure to also check out our website, muweatherwatch.com, to see our entire library of episodes. Well, for the entire cast and crew, I'm Shane Brown. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.